go. So, friends, um, welcome. My name is uh, Ranjit Anipu. I'm joining in from New York. I'm a co founder of Be Waste Wise. Um, Be Waste Wise is uh, your knowledge partner for the resource revolution. Um, because um, if you're someone who's um, looking for solutions and knowledge, you can learn from hundreds of experts on our website. We've um, recorded um, easily engaging face-to-face uh, -face conversations with um, some of the best minds in um, circular economy and um, resources and waste management, where um, they not only discussed um, the most pressing issues of our time, but um, they also shared um, their invaluable expertise. Um, we've also recorded many training sessions, um, all of which are available online for free. You can just go to the website, www.wastewise.be. Now, if you're someone uh, with expertise who can help others um, find solutions, um, you can use our platform to um, reach, uh, reach a large and ever-growing audience. For example, um, this interview got uh, about 250 demonstrations, and this is only the first interview in our partnership with ISWA to uh, make knowledge more accessible to a global audience. By leveraging um, ISWA's strong network expertise and our models. This video will be watched by many people live. It will also be watched um, as a replay when it's recorded and published. And it will also be watched um, through the articles that we've written about it and the short video excerpts that will be um, made based on this video. So before we begin, um, I would like to thank Antonis because this partnership would not have been possible without his visionary leadership. Now, um, Antonis and uh, I have uh, known each other for over six years now. And uh, throughout my work in the US, Africa, Middle East and Asia, and his work worldwide, we have seen that uh, there is no um, global community for resources and waste management because um, we are extremely fragmented uh, regionally, sectorally, and ideologically. Now, uh, we began this partnership um, because we understand that um, there are um, billions of uh, decision makers looking for solutions worldwide, uh, but uh, there are only a few tens of uh, thousands who practice, study, and can provide those solutions or guide towards them. Now, um, we, we also began this partnership because we understand the need for sharing knowledge and uh, the need for creating an engaged global community. Um, the engaged global community is um, required for us to be able to scale solutions because the challenges that we face are really large, but the solutions are all local. And uh, we understand that we don't have to agree with everyone on everything. Uh, so as to be able to just help each other out or to find common ground and uh, to leverage each other's capabilities. Um, and uh, we also understand that without knowledge sharing and uh, collaboration, each one of us is weaker, has a smaller voice, and is less equipped to deal with today's complex challenges. Uh, finally, um, the, a significant part of today's knowledge dissemination is video and uh, and this, this is happening in all sectors. And um, this trend will only increase rapidly. So as we speak, Be Waste Wise is uh, partnering with uh, the Asian Development Bank and Waste Aid UK to build on this partnership with ISWA. So thank you again, my friend, and uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Antonis, um, warm welcome to you to Be Waste Wise. Thank you, Ranjit. And, uh, let me Let grab me the opportunity grab to say that uh, I'm really very glad that ISVA and Big Waste Wise start this partnership. I do believe for many years that uh, the International Solid Waste Association has a lot of great content, but we still have not found the right channels to communicate it worldwide. And part of the problem is what you already mentioned, that still the global community is under formulation. It's not shaped yet. But the other part is that the content is not enough. It's not going out alone. So before I congratulate you for Big Waste Wise initiative, which I'm very familiar with from the very beginning, I would like to tell you that for us, this is a strategic partnership and we will do 
everything possible to strengthen it and open it to more channels as well. And I'm sure that the more we are working together, not only will improve the communication, but the new content will arrive based on the demands of our uh, followers. So I'm very happy that we started this. And I think it's important that we started with a very hot topic, the China ban. Great. Um, getting right into it. So, um, Antonis, um, what's the status of uh, the Chinese regulations? Um, has the ban been implemented? And if it is or if it's not, which waste streams are the most affected and which are not? Well, I will go in brief because there are many technical details. And I have to thank uh, Swana and David Bitterman personally because uh, he made me aware of all the details very, very soon. I mean, roughly eight months before now. So what we have now is that from January 1st, the ban is active. Already, there are a lot of ships waiting to be controlled, but most of them, they, don't, they have no hope they will come back. And already we feel, we feel the impact from USA to UK and Australia, the impact in recyclable programs, in recycling programs is already felt, sometimes too hard, sometimes smoothly. In Europe, the problem is not that big yet because you have more lag time and a little bit more local processing capacity. Now, the ban concerns 24 different materials which were broadly imported by China in the previous years. And if you ask me, in a glance, I would say that the most important problems will be faced about plastics. Plastics will be mostly affected and plastic recycling programs worldwide will face several problems, at least temporarily. Um, well, um, that seems um, straightforward. So um, are there, um, you've discussed this, um, these issues in your blog, um, you know, about the China ban. Um, the East Coast President's blog, which I think is amazing that you actually keep writing um, about these important issues there. Um, you've discussed about the China ban there. And uh, a question based on that article is, um, are, are there any countries that have um, increased their recycling in the past two decades without relying on China as the easy answer? I know uh, many countries relied on China as the easy answer. So are there any countries which did without China increased recycling? Well, <clears throat> From a global perspective, I think we are going to be fair if we say that these were very few. i give you an example. Italy increased a lot its recycling rates, but why? Because it worked a lot with organic fraction. Organic fraction supply chain is the only supply chain that can easily close locally. So the countries that deal a lot with organic fraction, they increase their recycling rates, rates without being depending on China. Uh, there are also some other countries like Philippines and India that increase their recycling rates. But strangely, this, this happened through the informal sector because the informal sector recovers pure material that are locally easy to reprocess. So the countries that deal with recycling, let's say in an industrial scale, like Australia, USA, UK, a lot of the European countries, uh, their recycling rates are based a lot on the export to China. i give you an example for Europe. I'm sure David will say a lot about USA. In Europe, half of the plastic we recycled was exported to China. But which plastic was exported? Well, the reality is that in many curbside programs, what we received is a bin with 10, 15, and sometimes 20% impurities. This was not feasible to be locally processed. So it was easy, it was easier to export it to China. Why? Because Chinese ships are coming to Europe full of commercial products. And when they come back, they want to bring something also. It's not good for them to travel empty. So the easy answer was to take the plastic and give them back. There's a problem here. As Isva has already said by 2012 in our report, Global Recycling Markets, Plastic Waste, a story for one player written by Costas Velis, what you've said is that although we export them and build recycling rates, we knew very well that a lot of them were not actually recycled, but they were burned as a cheap fuel in completely inhuman conditions, creating pollution problems there. So in Europe, we say we increase the recycling rates. 
in China will really deteriorate the environmental and health impacts. Um, great. So um, generally, um, in, in most of our work, um, we see uh, when it comes to waste management, we see that um, a lot of people are hurting um, because of improper waste management worldwide. Um, but um, this happens to become a problem now in the U.S. and Europe, where we always thought that, you know, the waste management systems were properly um, developed. And um, clearly, um, they have built systems over the last 20 to 30 years based on, you know, this trend with China and based on um, uh, providing what's required for China, right? Mm -hmm. So, and now it's the friends in recycling and um, um, different stakeholders in recycling that are hurting in the, in the developed countries. So, when you consider the different stakeholders involved in recycling, like cities, citizens, MRFs, and uh, collectors, exporters, etc., um, who, who do you think are the winners and losers? Well, that's a very nice question, question and uh, I think you have to be very careful how to judge it. On the one hand, definitely, the recycling industry in USA, Europe and Australia, at least, will face problems, especially the ones who are dealing with plastics, because we are not ready to close the loops locally. And speaking frankly, if there was not the China ban, we will never be able. Exporting to China was the easy question, the easy answer to a very inconvenient question, how to deal with impurities. Now, on the other side, states and uh, waste management authorities might be also winners if they get the right message. And the, for me, the right message is very, very clear. We have to reprioritize the importance of recycling to our systems. For many years, we have persuaded people that recycling is the best they can do. Now it's obvious that it's not. And the introduction of circular economy and resource management as an integral part in every waste management system allow us the, uh, gives us the opportunity to push for waste prevention, reuse and repair, even if it is in the old fashioned type, to open this discussion. Now, I'm not sure that MRFs will be at the winners because MRFs are not ready to absorb this capacity. So probably one of the winners will be waste to energy plants that are ready to burn this excess of plastics. In some cases, as in USA, I'm pretty sure that there will be a lot of plastics in the landfills, maybe with a special price. And strangely, but not, it's not a paradox, I think on the global scale, one of the winners will be the informal recyclers. You know why? Because they always recover the purest materials. And these purest pure materials now probably will have a better price just because there will be fewer in a big excess. Now, there's another problem. There are already some reports. Uh, I have in my mind a report from Netherlands. I have in my mind a report from Australia and from Brazil. Also, Brazil was not that much dependent that the China ban has really dropped down the plastic recyclable prices locally. Because now, when you export half of it to China and now you have everything to be sold in your country, you know, the guys that buy become very, very selective. I think this is the big picture and I hope that this could be a good opportunity for policymakers to understand that recycling is an imperfect, costly, and very vulnerable solution unless you find closed loops on a local or regional scale. Right, and um, we discussed this um, earlier. Um, you also mentioned that, e uh, and I've heard this from various industry experts, that um, this will be a short-term pain, but um, it is actually citizens and um, cities and governments are the winners on the long term because of this um, ban. So could you talk about that a little bit? Well, listen, um, I think that uh, as the International Solid Waste is a global association, it's good to have a global perspective about winners, losers, and cities. Now, let's be frank. China does what it does about the ban, saying that with this, it will protect better the environment and the health in its country, in, in the country. So it's like saying that importing all these materials the previous year was not done in the best way. We didn't, we were not able 
to manage them in the best way. I know very well that also China now has a big program for environmental protection that is much more general. So part of this program is to wipe out or to reduce substantially the small scale manufacturers and recyclers in favor of big verticalized um, chains in China. So this needs to be more professional, more industrial, and this needs better uh, raw materials. Now, it's also part of the problem is that China wants to develop its own domestic recycling programs in its own way. So globally speaking, Chinese will gain from that as citizens, as economy, and environmentally as well. And you cannot blame for them. I mean, sometimes I'm getting pissed off because people say, what China did to us? No. China did to us something that it was a matter of time that it will happen and you knew about that. Now, let's go to the Western world. What will happen to the Western world is that now we will face the real question. For so many years, we were saying people, recycle and nothing happens. No, it happens. Because when you consume more and more plastics, plastic cups, plastic straws, plastic diapers, uh, whatever is plastic. When you consume so many plastics, it's a fallacy to believe that if you recycle them, the problem is solved. First of all, because not all of them are recycled. We know very well that from the current plastic materials, less than 40 or 30 percent can be easily recyclable. And second, because even if you recycle everything, so what? You increase consumptions and you need consumption and you need more and more plastic. That's the case. So. We face now the real problem, how to reduce our dependence on plastic materials. And if we face it, we're going to be winners. Great. Um, so, uh, friends, you're um, watching the first interview as part of the partnership between um, ISWA, International Solid Waste Association, and Be Waste Wise. And uh, we'll be taking questions in about 13 minutes. And we also have a surprise guest for us. So um, wait uh, <laughs> till the very end. Um, so uh, thank you again for joining us. And um, and Thomas, I have to ask you another question. Um, I know you've been talking about the future of waste management quite a bit. I mean, we've been discussing this for a while now. So, um, and when you say recycling better in your blog article, um, what do you actually mean by that? And and what's the status of um, robotics and AI infrastructure in recycling better? Um, I'm asking this question because um, the, the Western world has developed their systems over the last one three decades mm -hmm. um, on a single trend, which is, you know, China accepting a lot of uh, low quality recyclables. So what role um, do these new technologies play? What's not, not just the role, but can you also talk, talk about the status? You know, how much time frame? Can you talk about the time frame for these? Okay. I think there is a reality which is more complex than sometimes you understand it. The problem is that you guys and me, we are involved in the waste management world deeply. It's our daily life uh, integrating in this. And sometimes we lose the big picture. The big picture is that overall, the global plastic industry is really growing. There are $180 billion investments prepared to be completed before 2025. When we say the global plastic industry, we mean a part of the best emitters of CO2 emissions. We are speaking for an industry completely based on fossil fuels. So forget a little bit what we are going to do. The real problem is that we have to, are going to face more and more, more and more quantities of plastics to manage, either as waste or recyclables or resources. Now, what is the status now? The status, as you all know, there are obvious things that we really struggle to recycle. We still have not found a massive solution for plastic cups of coffee. We still have not found a good solution for the hard plastics like the ones we use in our pens. We still don't know what to do with our toothbrushes, just to give some small examples. And we know very well that the problem is even bigger with the composite materials that are plastics, paper, some heavy metal, some paint, like the ones in Amita or like, you know, I used to speak about the Pringle factor. Pringles are great chips, but the one who created the packaging is a disaster for the, created a disaster. It has aluminum on the bottom, plastic on top, and a very composite paper around. It's best for food protection, but not for, 
not for recycling. So I think one of the major uh, challenges now is to link the designers of the products and the packaging with the waste management world. And this is working on that. We are preparing a common initiative with the, with the Copenhagen School of Design, just about that. And we have already delivered two products, one about designing jeans and about designing plastic packaging. Now, can we increase the recycling rates in plastics from 25 or 30 percent that they are now to 60? I'm completely sure that we cannot. Because those plastics that are prepared and consumed now, a lot of them are not recyclable. So the only thing we can do with them is either to dispose them of or burn them or just put them in the landfill. If we want to increase the recycling rates, we have to redesign what is the plastic industry. And this is hard because they are much stronger than recyclers and waste managers. Um, that's that's wonderful to know, uh, Antonis, because um, um, you're working with the design school because um, I just came across news that the Association of Plastic Recycles um, in the US has also um, started um, something similar working with um, um, larger organizations to you know design their products better. Um, um, do you have any uh, final thoughts? We have about four minutes before we bring our um, surprise guest um, onto the yeah. screen. I just want to say two things. First of all, I think we need to understand the broader picture. The broader picture says that maybe in USA there will be a lot of jobs lost due to the uh, less opportunities for recycling, but the big winners will be the plastic industry in USA. I have already written about it, but what we saw is that last year China reduced the imports of plastic scrap by 11% and increased the imports of virgin uh, polyethylene by 9, if I remember well. It's going to be more. So at the end of the day, the China ban will result in more virgin plastic consumption. And this is the real problem for the world. My second point is that I think we don't have to lose this opportunity. The China ban is an opportunity first to reprioritize recycling, as I already said, but also it's an opportunity to think about marine litter on a global scale. Because there is a huge risk that China ban results in more plastics in the sea. And uh, we have proven a lot and we have discussed and there is a very great report created by ISVA about marine litter and how it's linked with waste management improvement in each and every country. So let's grab the opportunity. Let's face the China ban as an opportunity to rediscover our waste management systems rather than complaining about it. That's it. Great, wonderful. Um, so, guys, I mean, uh, so we'll be taking questions in another seven minutes. And um, I was just thinking, I mean, we've been talking about David uh, and Swana for, um, Anton has mentioned him twice, and, you know, how awesome would it be if he actually just showed up? Um, so uh, we have David Byron here from the International, um, so from the Solid Waste Association of North America. Um, and David, uh, welcome to Be Waste Wise. Um, and can you unmute yourself? Great, wonderful. Welcome, David. Good morning. Um, great. So um, thanks for joining us. And um, well, um, US and Canada are two of the most impacted countries due to the ban. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about uh, what is the way forward and what is SWANA doing? Sure, I'd be glad to. And first of all, thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in, in this webinar. And Antonis, I think you did a really terrific job providing a, a global overview and some potential paths forward for the recycling community and the planet. Um, we, you asked earlier about winners and losers. The biggest loser um, if, in the current situation is the planet. We're going to have 9 billion people on planet Earth by 2050, if not more. And waste generation continues to increase at an alarming rate. And that material needs somewhere to go. And if we don't come up with sustainable uh, systems in every country and in the United States and the states and in Canada and the provinces, uh, we're, we're going to have more plastic in the ocean, we're going to have more uh, illegal dumping, and we're going to have more greenhouse gases. So uh, it's really important that we all come together to work on this issue. Uh, the, the Chinese, I, I don't particularly like the expression, the China ban. Um, I, I refer to them as the Chinese waste import restrictions. 
The reason I do that is there's really three parts to this. So China has banned 24 uh, commodities from coming into their country. Uh, plastic, post-consumer plastic and mixed paper are the two most important of those for people in the recycling community. And while Antonis focused on plastic, in the United States, since we still recycle such a large amount of paper and only recycle actually a small amount of plastic compared to paper, the biggest impact has been on the mixed paper market. Um, that impact has been primarily in uh, the West Coast of the United States, California, Oregon, and Washington. Why there? Because those are the port cities, those are the states within which port cities receive material from China, the commercial goods that Antonis mentioned, come into Los Angeles, San Francisco, Seattle, and Portland, and then they go back to China uh, with scrap and, and recyclable material. And so uh, that was an easy outlet for people in the Western United States to send their recyclables. In fact, a, a, a statistic that I've learned over the last few months that is just remarkable is that about 25% of all the exported material that went out of California ports by weight in 2016 was scrap and recyclables. A quarter of the stuff moving out of California ports was, was scrap and recyclables. So, so the quantity that we were sending, not just to China, but to some other places was, was quite enormous. There's also been a, an impact in the Northeastern United States in the New England states around Boston and in Eastern Canada, which are also somewhat dependent on exports because there's not a lot of landfill or waste to energy capacity in those parts of the country and those countries. And both of those parts of the United States and Canada have strong recycling cultures. So what we've seen is we've seen a lot of stockpiling of material. Uh, bales of uh, plastic and paper are piling up in warehouses outside of MRFs. Um, I've got about 10 pictures on my phone from different people of parking lots that are filled with bales and people aren't sure what to do with them, but they know the right thing to do isn't to send them to a landfill. And so uh, we've seen this on the West Coast and in Massachusetts in particular for the last few months. And my concern is that the, the virus is beginning to spread as the uh, import ban, import restrictions take effect. So I mentioned the first part of the import restrictions, which is the ban on the 24 materials. The second part of the import restrictions is for things that are not on the list of 24, China will only accept those materials if the contamination rate for them is 0.5% or less. That's an extraordinarily difficult contamination standard for a MRF to, to satisfy. I know of a very small number of MRFs in the United States and Canada that are being inspected by the Chinese that are apparently satisfying that standard, but it's a very small number. So that's the second piece of the import restrictions. And the third piece is the fact that starting in the third quarter of last year and extending into the first quarter of this year, China has drastically reduced the amount of quota it is issuing to the mills to bring in imports. So there were many millions of tons of import quotas given to various mills. Those numbers have been decreasing by, by, by very, very large numbers in percentage terms, 70%, 80%. So much less material is going to China than was going to China a year ago. So what are we doing here in the United States? Well, the, the, the industry is trying to attack the contamination problem. China, uh, China imposed these restrictions in part because it did not want all the crap that people were sending along with the paper and the plastic. And um, Americans are really good at a lot of things, but we're not very good recyclers. We put the wrong thing in the blue bin. Uh, plastic bags don't belong in curbside recycling. Hoses don't belong in curbside recycling. Um, I've seen bowling balls and um, ammunition come across the, the, the processing lines. Uh, we're, we're trying to attack the, the contamination on the front end with better education. Um, and on the back end, what a lot of the facilities have done is they've slowed down their lines. So they're, they're slowing down the process. Uh, they're hiring more people to do quality control and remove contamination. They're actually accelerating their investment in infrastructure, in new systems, new machines, including robotics, to try to make the material that they're producing uh, better. And Antonis mentioned who the winners and the losers are. 
the biggest winner in the China ban situation are the people who make recycling equipment. They make no mistake about it that those people are very, very busy right now talking to local governments and private sector recyclers um, because there's a lot of interest in either purchasing new equipment, upgrading equipment, et cetera. Um, I, I would love to get those people on the phone, but they're too busy selling at the moment. Uh, one of the positive results of this is that we're seeing a renewed interest in some things that have not been terribly popular here in North America, uh, particularly in the United States. There's discussion now of the circular economy, which some in the United States think is, you know, this European thing that, you know, we don't need to do. Um, there's a more of an interest and I'm hearing discussion about emphasizing waste reduction, not so much recycling. Because part of the reason we have this problem is we're such prolific waste producers. We, we generate some mil, tens of millions of straws every single day. An example of a single use product that we use and we throw away, but it has to be handled somewhere. Um, there, there's an obviously an increased interest in uh, technology. And uh, I responded to a, a, a survey uh, yesterday from one of the leading waste periodicals in the United States interested in the intersection between technology and uh, China's waste import restrictions. Um, the other, the, the, the fourth thing that I'll mention very quickly is um, there's, there, we're, 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 we've been doing a great job of ch what we call chasing tons in the United States. So success in recycling is defined as, well, if we diverted more stuff from landfill or waste to energy, it's successful. Well, we're beginning to rethink whether that's the right metric and right methodology, because it's not that we have a scarcity of landfill space, at least here in the United States. The reason we should be recycling, or one of the principal reasons we should be recycling relates to climate change. And so maybe we should be refocusing on those elements that if we recycle them and divert them away from a landfill um, or not produce them at all, will have a, a more positive environmental effect. Um, so what's SWANA doing? So just yesterday, SWANA announced the formation of a new recycling task force. This is a new uh, group within SWANA that brings different technical division leadership together, uh, brings people from both the private and the public sector, United States and Canada, and includes several people who are not members of SWANA to come together to discuss what's going on and what we should be doing as, as, a, as a country and what kind of guidance we can be, uh, we, we can be giving to policymakers and others. Uh, the problem, one of the problems we have here in the United States is that waste is a local, locally regulated activity. There's no federal policy out of Washington, D.C. regarding recycling or, or waste management, other than you have to cover the, the waste at the landfill at the end of the day. And so as a result, this is, this is a, a challenge for us in, in terms of trying to achieve certain goals. Um, we're going to be having conversations with policymakers here in Washington over the next couple of weeks regarding the impact of the waste recycling restrictions on different places in the United States, because as I mentioned a few minutes ago, we're seeing the, the, the impact spread from California and the, the, the coast inland in places like Arizona and Idaho and in the southeastern United States to several states and cities there. So um, we're in the very early stages of developing SWANA's response, but we're very concerned about it. And we hope to be able to, to uh, participate and coordinate with ISWA, Be Wastewise and others and vet best practices um, and 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 solutions to uh, this 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 concern. Great, thank you very much. That was very um, useful and enlightening. So, I have a question. Um, uh, we're taking questions from. So, um, send send us any questions that you have. And um, the first question that we have um, is uh, um, to um, maybe Antonis could um, respond to this. Um, Laura from Tanzania. Um, is asking, um, will this ban have an impact on Africa, where plastic is mainly um, sent to landfill or separated by informal collectors? Um, did African countries already send it to China? Um, that, that, that's the question. But I just wanted to add, um, you know, I, I just came back from a, a World Bank project in Ethiopia, and there uh, in certain cities, I saw that even the high quality plastic, which is generally picked off in any developing country, it was just lying there on the streets because there were no recycling markets in, in Ethiopia, in, in, in cities which were far from Addis Ababa. So um, could you talk about this, um, Antonis? Yes. 
Yes. Well, that's a very good question because one of the pro one of the issues that uh, I did not mention is that uh, the I don't remember how exactly David told it the imp the restriction in imports. I don't want <laughs> he's right about the China ban. One of the problems is that this will create global environmental impacts. And the impacts will not be too much, I mean, in USA or in Europe. We will find a way to deal with the problem sooner or later. We need time to adjust. But there will be two major environmental impacts that will be global. First, the immediate response of the plastic scrap brokers is to identify alternative markets to China so they can continue the business model they have. And those alternative markets, most of them, will be around Southeastern Asia. I'm thinking mainly about Vietnam, Laos, Malaysia, and Thailand. And there are already signs that increasing quantities are driven to these countries. And we really don't know if they are ready to receive them. We really don't know if they're going to follow the Chinese example and burn them for cheap fuel. And I'm pretty sure that there is no local capacity to manage them. Now, I guess this does not concern Africa. If I was living in Africa, I would be more concerned for the possibility to receive plastic scrap that is not accepted, not even in Southeastern Asia, rather than exporting. And this might be a big problem, especially for plastic scrap that contains hazardous materials as well. Okay, great. Um, David, we have a question for you. Um, so uh, this is a question from um, Mariam. Um, she's asking, um, can the uh, US and Europe look towards other developing countries such as India, Pakistan, etc., to export plastic waste or would the focus be more on finding in-house local solutions? Could you talk a little bit about the, the infrastructure part of the local recycling solutions? Uh, we, we have uh, many questions, so uh, could you wrap it up? Uh, but please do talk about the infrastructure part of it. Um, I think that would be really Sure. Just to amplify on what Antonis said and in response to uh, Mary, Mary Ann's question, Mary Ann's question, um, there is material now that used to go to China that's going to Southeast Asia and in particular India. Um, there's been some data that I've seen where the amount of material going to India is increasing dramatically. Um, and we have concerns about both whether there is domestic capacity in any of those countries to handle that material and also... Um, at some point in time, some of those countries are going to say, why do we want to be the uh, garbage dump for the EU or the United States? And they'll close the door the same way China did. And so my concern is that these are just temporary Band-Aid solutions. Um, and I, I'm not aware of uh, much exporting of waste material from Africa to China, although it would not surprise me if, that in South Africa, both because it's a more developed country than some of the other places, as well as because of it has ports and is somewhat more proximity, uh, there could be some exports there. Um, we, we've also seen an interest from the Chinese in potentially uh, developing um, recycling infrastructure here in the United States. So while the Chinese are reportedly looking at installing waste infrastructure in Vietnam and other countries in Southeast Asia, they're actually bringing a delegation over to the United States next week, and I'll be meeting with them the following week here in Washington to talk about investment opportunities to take plastic, turn it into flake here in the United States, and then ship it to China. So there are some interesting uh, threads and ideas being looked at, and I'm hopeful that this will help to address some of the situation because we don't have sufficient domestic infrastructure to handle all the plastic in the United States or Canada. Um, it's interesting how most of the plastic packaging is designed in companies here in the US and, um, you know, it's an interesting part to, uh, we could uh, maybe delve into at a different time. Uh, but uh, we have one more question. Um, we actually have a bunch of questions, but this question is from um, Andrea. Um, she's asking, uh, Antonis, this question is for you. So she's asking, um, why does the EU circular economy package and the new EU plastic strategy um, does not focus more on waste reduction or minimization. Are, are you aware of the, these two? Um, can you talk about them? Yeah. Well, I think that uh, we have to be very frank. What's happening with the EU plastic strategy is similar to what's happening with the circular economy in general. 
what's the problem here? The problem is that we say wonderful things for circular economy as a concept. We are trying to develop it to more uh, specific and tangible projects. But at the end of the day, what's happening is that the only industrial sector that has to face specific obligations about circular economy is the recycling and waste management industry. And all the other industries are left to follow on a voluntary basis. Well, we have to say the truth. It's not enough to be ambitious for the waste management and recycling industry because our industry, at the end of the day, will receive the leftovers of all the other manufacturers. If circular economy packages do not involve the other manufacturers with specific targets, with obligations, with incentives to change, then we will not be able to receive that. And as a comment, the EU plastic strategy is very ambitious. This is good. I would prefer for it, for it to be also more practical about the manufacturers. But this is a general problem because our industry is the weakest one comparing to other industrial sectors. So at the end of the day, it's easier to impose targets and obligations on us rather than the plastic industry. Great. Um, thank you, Antonis. Uh, we have another question from um, Guna. Um, and Guna is asking, will the ban um, impact the textile waste recycling? Um, is there much data on this? David, can you take this? Sure. Um, so there's a number of categories of banned materials on the list of China's 24 items that are textiles. And so um, there is some quantity of textile waste that was being sent over to China that is no longer permitted to be sent there. I will tell you, I don't have any data on the quantity of that because it's, it's probably infinitesimally small compared to paper and plastic. Much of the textiles that are, are generated in the United States uh, for diversion um, end up uh, actually going to, to Africa. Um, but uh, I would be glad to do a little bit of research and try to find some information on that because that's the third piece after paper and plastic that there, there should be some impact. Uh, but right now we're really focusing on the paper and the plastic. Okay, great, wonderful. Um, um, Antonis, uh, so friends, uh, we only have um, uh, three more minutes um, to end the session. So if you have any other questions or comments, um, send us um, to them at uh, connect.wastewise.be and we'll try to get them um, answered. Um, and um, thank you again for joining us. And, uh, um, you know, this is the, the, this is the beginning of the partnership between ISWA and um, Be Waste Wise. We have uh, five more events coming up this year. So if you want to, um, you know, be um, updated, please follow ISPA on social media or sign up to their newsletter. You could also do the same thing with um, Be Waste Wise. Go to our website, um, follow and um, subscribe to our newsletter. And before we end, before I ask um, the final comments from both uh, David and Antonis, Antonis, there is a quick question to you um, from Ben. Um, will this um, import restrictions, will this China ban, will, will this kind of um, action lead to other countries becoming more insular? Um, is the idea of a waste Schengen in the EU, EU feasible? Well, well, that's a very, very, very uh, difficult question and a very hot debate. Now, a few years ago, the discussion about a European Union Schengen zone about waste was hotter than it is today. But uh, this is not only about water. The European unity was hotter a few years ago than it is today in politics as well. I think that the China ban, especially for Europeans, means two particular things. First, the European plastic industry should change itself and be and it is able to receive more materials, more pure materials. So Europeans have to stop thinking about recycling everything in one bin. They have to develop sink stream plastic recycling. And this will help a lot to find solutions. Second, I don't believe that the China ban drives against globalization. Globalization will go on and there will be other outlets as well. Of course, no outlet can substitute the giant because China was a giant receiving everything. So I would say that the China ban will help us to rebalance between globalization and the necessity to develop local loops. And the same push to rebalance can be also done by the fourth industrial revolution, new technologies. 
Personally, I believe that one of the best hopes to resolve the waste, uh, the plastic recycling problem, is the evolution of 3D printers. And I'm very happy because I know there are already experiments in place to recycle a lot of different materials, plastic materials, using 3D printers and producing new products. All right, Antonis, could you also um, have any closing rem remarks, less than a minute? I just have one closing remark. I believe that we are going more and more faster towards a very serious crisis about the role of plastics in our lives. The situation we are living with marine litter, with the introduction of plastics and microplastics in the, marine, uh, in the food chain, will oblige us sooner or later to identify alternatives. So the situation is like it was in 1890 in New York and London about the horse manure crisis. These two cities back then, they were trying to find an alternative to horse manure, but they couldn't because horse was so central to the daily lives for everything. The solution to this problem did not come from the engineers that were involved with the problem or by the architects and the urban planners. It came by Henry Ford by the introduction of cars. Now, I'm optimist that we will find such an alternative for plastics as well, but I hope we will find it soon before our food chain become too polluted. And even if we find it, if we found that solution, we have to remember that 100 years after Henry Ford put the car in our lives, now we face a lot of problems from the air exhaustion of cars. So we will still have a lot of work to do. Thank you. Um, and no, I think that that's actually very optimistic because um, if we solve all the problems now, I mean, what will be the purpose of future generations? I mean, they'll, they'll become really lost uh, without a purpose. David, do you have any final comments, final remarks? Um, let someone. Sure. Um, earlier this week, uh, there was an event in the United States called the Global Waste Management Symposium, which occurs every two years. And one of the speakers there uh, works for Leonardo DiCaprio's foundation. Um, and he said something that I, I thought was just remarkable. He said uh, that the biggest opportunity, um, the, the biggest economic opportunity in the history of our planet is financing a, a zero waste environment. And I think we have to look at that in the context of, of the China conversation. Um, and we should recognize that it's a, that, that it's a very big, heavy lift. It's a big challenge. Uh, but I do think that between technology, innovation, and changing individuals, people's behavior, I think we'll be able to develop a more sustainable uh, system for recycling, both here, in Latin, both here in North America as well as throughout the world. Um, this is a central focus for SWANA. Um, I did not know last year that I was going to become an expert on international trade policy. Um, and I'm not really an expert, but, but I know enough about it to be dangerous now. Uh, we're going to be continuing to work on this issue. Uh, Next month at one of our national events, we're bringing in somebody from the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, Waste Management, and several local government officials to do a keynote session at, at our event in, in Denver. And although we haven't yet formally announced uh, WasteCon in later 2018 in, in Nashville, Tennessee, one of the central themes is going to be global and international issues. And we look forward to partnering with, with Antonis, Be WasteWise, and others to, to, to bring expertise and knowledge to this and other issues uh, for the benefit of all attendees. And again, I wanna thank you for inviting me to participate um, in this webinar today. No, great, uh, thank you very much guys, Antonis and uh, David for joining us. Friends, um, you can go to um, swana.org, S-W-A-N-A.org. Um, you can go to um, iswa.org, I-S-W-A.org, and wastewise.be, wastewise.be, just as, as it sounds. So um, you can go there, you can find a lot of information um, Aswana has a. Sorry about that. Aswana has a, um, a upcoming event. Aswana Palooza. Um, you know, attend that, and it also has um, numerous local events. Be part of the local um, communities, and you know, uh, so that you can stay updated. Same with this one. It, it has a conference coming up, a global conference, and it has numerous um, local events. And uh, Be Waste Wise uh, itself is doing numerous online events. Um, tomorrow, we'll be interviewing Adam Reed. He's one of the most respected professionals in the industry. And um, he'll be talking about, um, he'll be talking a little bit about the China ban, its impact on Europe, but he'll also be talking about the trends, other trends and his life, his work. So um, join us tomorrow with Adam Reed. And uh, with that, thank you very much. Uh,
um, stay updated. All right, bye. Thank you. Thank you.